Good evening. I'm Courtney Graham with the Engagement Department at the Art Institute of Chicago. Welcome to this evening's virtual program on Armored Tournament. This program is made possible by the Mickey Silverstein Endowed Fund. We're so glad to have you joining us virtually. And while we wish that we could welcome you in person, we hope this digital format offers a chance to stay connected to the Art Institute from home. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Kevin Vitato is the Senior Industrial Designer at Priority Designs. He is joined by our own Jonathan Tavares, Associate Curator of Applied Arts of Europe. We're so thrilled to have them both here with us to discuss tournament armor and the relationship between armor and contemporary protective equipment. Thank you both so much for being here. I will turn things over to you, Jonathan. Thanks so much, Courtney. Um, I really appreciate that introduction. So um, the Art Institute and its galleries uh, present two sides uh, of a coin, arms and armor for battle uh, or war, and the flip side, arms and armor for tournament. That is sports equipment. Uh, today's conversation is focused on the latter category, uh, the sport of the late Middle Ages and Renaissance, the melee or tourney, the joust, and tournament on foot. To preface our discussion, uh, first I will present a brief context around the origin and development of tournaments. Uh, and then, and most importantly, uh, Kevin uh, will join me in conversation over several key pieces of tournament equipment uh, in our collection, uh, gaining his unique perspective as a modern sports equipment designer. And finally, uh, we'll have questions fielded by Courtney. So, there we are. So there is conjecture over where and when so-called knightly tournaments uh, or mock battles, uh, melees, of armored nobles first started in Western Europe. It might have begun in the 11th or 12th century around the Southern Netherlands, Flanders, and along the Northern French borders in what is today Belgium. There, these early tournaments were sort of war games or melees uh, with teams set out to capture each other for ransom and often taking as prizes horses uh, and equipment along other things. They were, uh, from their onset, dangerous to participants. Uh, fatalities did happen, uh, though the point was never to kill. They were usually held on the borders between lands, especially as tournaments were periodically outlawed uh, by some rulers. Uh, owing to their potential for accidents and deaths, uh, the church also banned them as well uh, over time, uh, up and down different situations. Only the nobility uh, or the knightly class or landowners were allowed to participate or could afford to, and they were watched uh, as seen here uh, in this manuscript by members of the court, particularly noblewomen and specially erected grandstands. Uh, in this early 14th century manuscript depicts uh, the Duke of Anhalt in Germany, literally pommeling uh, an opponent uh, with ladies uh, discussing the event uh, among other things. The other major development in this early medieval period uh, is the beginnings of heraldry, or literally coats of arms, as seen here, the brightly colored imagery or blazons uh, over the armor in the crests on the helmets, meant to show identity when the armor and helms concealed uh, the face and body. It's likely of no coincidence that family heraldry, that is the system of, and rules of these devices and colors, developed in the same time and place as tournaments and was also used in battle for the same purpose. Uh, it links uh, to our own use of team jerseys uh, today, or at least uh, for the same initial purpose, which is identity, friend from foe, uh, opponent versus teammate. In these early tournaments, uh, equipment, the arms, the armor, and the horses were generally the same as in war, uh, though blunted swords and lances uh, may have been used. In the interest of sport and to prevent needless bloodshed, uh, governing rules and judges gradually crept in, and with them specialized equipment that differed uh, from that uh, used in battle. Uh, different types of specialized tournaments also developed, chief among them the joust, where two opposing mounted men uh, strike each other with lances with awarded points based on uh, where the lance hit and if the opponent was unhorsed. And of course, the, the rules in the warden of points were changed and were different everywhere. And so the joust developed first as a practice uh, or opening event for the melee, 
uh, that started with lance charges. And by the 16th century represented in this painting, it was indeed very specialized. Uh, lots of fanfare, uh, prescribed equipment, and many regional variations, and as I said, with different rules and types of armor. Uh, this tournament in Rome, uh, held at the Vatican uh, in 1560, clearly shows uh, by this stage the church was no longer opposed uh, to tournaments, uh, but in fact even hosted them. Uh, some tournaments were held as jousts of peace, which uh, with the most protective uh, equipment prescribed, others as jousts of war, still intended as peaceful sport, but wearing lighter, more mobile uh, battle armor uh, with the potential for more injury. So a bit more dangerous. Uh, tournaments constantly move back and forth between training for war uh, and as sport, um, all on, or as a sport all of its own. There we are. Tournaments on foot were also mm -hmm. specialized, but they too derive from training for events like judicial or trial by combat, a sanctioned duel for which few ever happened uh, beyond the early 1400s as this event chronicled well over 100 years later in uh, the actual manuscript. Oops. Uh, the foot tournament is here, uh, or tourney would develop as courtly spectacle with much less risk. A barrier set to prevent hits below the waist. Uh, theatrics were also very much involved. And in this 1560s tournament, we see pitted contestants dressed as Amazon warriors with uh, long skirts against uh, wild men with woolly costumes worn over their protective armor. Uh, these events were often fought indoors as well as out and in evenings as well as during the day as part of uh, feasts in wedding festivities. Uh, what, uh, so that was a, a very brief uh, view of tournaments uh, in their context. Uh, and now I would like to bring uh, Kevin into the discussion. So uh, Kevin, as a curator, I try to think of ways of interpreting armor uh, for myself as much as uh, for visitors. Uh, one of the ways I think of framing these objects is looking at them through the ingenuity and artistry of design. Uh, perhaps this image uh, from the early 16th century speaks uh, to that most, especially uh, to the collaboration between armorers, uh, the craftsmen who made these incredible pieces, who were, of course, also designers uh, of the equipment, and the patrons who commissioned and wore them to protect their body and lives. Uh, and so here we're seeing the Emperor Maximilian tapping the shoulder of his court armorer, um, basically uh, visiting uh, his design team uh, and uh, dictating, of course, what he wants and how he wanted it. Uh, so Kevin, as a modern sports and protective gear designer, uh, how do you see this image? Does this uh, image uh, in interchange resonate with you? Well, I think when I've looked at uh, many of these images, this is one of my favorites because it is the workshop. It's what we do here. Um, we, have, we have areas in our building here that uh, we have gear hanging on the walls and we often have our clients who might be the, uh, the best players at their sport come in and on, it's not the king, but they're the kings respectively in their sport. And uh, we, we use them as experts uh, to help us guide with our designs. Um, and I love the way that they're all just uh, working and building. Uh, we, we build prototypes uh, and gain our way to production just like that. Um, these two images are interesting. This is of our facility. Uh, the image on the right is a, is a very common shot of one of our meeting rooms where at the beginning of projects, uh, we gather and we just sketch ideas and bounce, uh, bounce ideas back and forth, um, hang stuff up on the walls and then bring in the client. Kind of uh, the client helps us focus uh, our efforts on what they want. Uh, the picture on the left is is, our, is one of our studios, our main studio, um, where all the engineers and, and designers hang out. I guess it would be a good thing to note when you go back to that uh, older image, uh, you know, there's just a couple folks in there who might have been uh, the, the experts at metallurgy mm -hmm. or at um, working with the soft goods, uh, how things attach, uh, how things articulate, things like that. Um, in soft goods, you mean like padding and, and all the padding and, and under undergarment. Uh, um, all yeah, the specialists. Mm -hmm. So you're part of a, a large team 
of, of specialists. And of course, in the Middle Ages and Renaissance, there were specialists, there were uh, forgers, the actual armor, there were grind millmen who grinded the armor and polished the armor. There were tailors who made the undergarments, which we'll talk a little bit about later. So there's definitely a larger chain of production then as it is now. Uh, but it's, it seems like you have a lot under one roof, a lot of prototype or, uh, being work that you do together with your team on site. Exactly. So we use, like, as I said, we use the experts that are out in the, uh, in the field playing the games. And our clients are certainly many times experts. Under our roof, though, you have industrial designers, you mm -hmm. have, I said, soft goods experts, hard goods people, engineers, prototyping people. And do you come from an industrial or a different background yourself? My background is industrial design. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's a degree that many uh, universities offer. Um, another term for it might be product development, mm -hmm. uh, but it's product in the sense of hard goods. Many times products used for electronics and coding and things nowadays. Um, I use the term as far as uh, things you can hold in your hand uh, like protective gear. And I imagine you get a lot of pushback from your clients as well. Uh, I, we certainly have evidence or knowledge of Maximilian here, the emperor, who once told his armorers or his recorded saying, arm me to my will because it's I who wears the armor in battle, not you. Yeah. So uh, certainly that probably comes into a large play into what you do as well. And at the end of the day, you know, they're paying the bills and we give them what they want. <laughs> So we probably don't think of armorers as designers, but they are. Uh, they're very much part and parcel of a tradition that you're a part of today. Um, and they're essentially, they're, they're answering uh, the call for solutions to the problem, which is we have soft bodies and we can't on ourselves take the impact of a lance or a sword or today, uh, you know, a hockey stick. So we need to have a, a external shell, a, an exoskeleton constructed. Um, and so with that, I'd like to usher in our first example, um, speaking largely chronologically with some of the examples that we have here today. Uh, this is a, a, a helm, a jousting helm in our collection. This is about as specialized uh, sports equipment as we can get. This helmet weighs nearly 20 pounds. Um, it, the weight would have been distributed over the shoulders. Uh, one part that's not seen here is there was a hinged hasp or uh, sort of almost like a, a steel um, uh, portion that bolted uh, to the breastplate to the front and also to the back to, to stiffen it. And uh, you can see a large uh, eye opening so you could see um, your opponent. So this is not something you would ever wear in battle. Uh, you would be uh, really asking for major in instability uh, and uh, problems if you wore this in battle, if you fell over for sure. So, um, you John, know, we did have you mentioned, to, yeah, did, sorry, did you mention that, that there are details on the front lower part of the neck that help hold mm -hmm. up? It's not, That's right. yeah, it's not so, all resting on your head, right? It's, it's, it's all resting on your shoulders. Uh, that's how it would have been. Um, and this one definitely has uh, evidence of use. So if we look at the next slide here, this is a, a coronel, or this is the steel tip of a lance that would have been used with the, against this helmet uh, in a joust. And we can see uh, on the top of the helmet clear evidence. There are these large uh, gashes uh, over the top uh, where the coronel uh, sort of hit um, the steel and, and, and made like a furrow into it. Uh, the force of impact is quite considerable. Um, in terms of uh, modern analysis, uh, basically you're looking at horses that are uh, not at a gallop at all, but canting at a combined 30 miles an hour. Um, and you, you've got a thousand pound horse and you've got a, about a 150, 200 pound man. And the armor with this helmet could be about 80 pounds. So all of that pinpointed on this lance head. Um, and this is what could have happened. Both yeah. the horse and the rider could fall over. So you get that heavy beast falling on you. So you need to protect yourself for that after fall as well, not just the initial struck. Uh, of the lance, potentially on either the helmet uh, or the shield. 
Jonathan, we tried to run we tried to run some quick numbers just to give a mm -hmm. a sense uh, in layman's terms what the force. That's so important. Um, so I, don't hold me to this. We just, <laughs> but um, you know, you take a ten pound bowling ball up to the a second story of your house and drop it on your chest from someone on the ground, and that's the force. You had mentioned three to four hundred joules at impact. That's right. That's uh, what so we um, tried to uh, convert it in there percent. loosely. Don't, don't, <laughs> I'm sure it could be figured out a little tighter, but um, it, I guess the point is it's it's one heck of an impact. That that's like, that's like astounding. A car wreck, right. Yeah, it's it's like I, you as you've said once before to me that it's like a car crash on a pinpoint. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, so these helmets were definitely designed to help with that. And uh, we can see here, this is what our helmet, this is a second helmet that we have in our collection from the same time and place that still has its steel uh, hasp in the front of it that bolted down over the chest. Uh, but what we're seeing in the diagram here is the uh, the sort of uh, leather straps that came out of these little slots in the side of the helmet in these pair of ties that attach uh, the lining. And this is a surviving lining uh, that is in the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna. Again, exactly contemporary with our helmet. Uh, it's made out of linen, out of wool, out of tow. And some of these early linings even used cotton, which they imported from the Mediterranean. But the key thing here is, is this use of strapping. Um, and I was curious, Kevin, uh, looking at this arrangement, uh, what are your thoughts? Um, you know, when I, think, when, I, when I think of, when I look at these, I'm fascinated because uh, many of the projects we do now, we focus on keeping the protection where it's supposed to be. And, um, you know, whether it's an arm guard or shoulder guards or, or headgear, um, it doesn't work if it's not sitting over the part of the bodies that it's designed to protect. And I, I love the efforts that, that they took to make sure that uh, your head's sitting in the right spot behind, you know, your, your mm -hmm. air that you could see out of. Because um, I think if you, you could easily get shifted in a position and that could cause injury. Um, so I, I love these images. Yeah, and you can see these belts uh, that go across the forehead and chin. They're literally strapping uh, and pushing uh, the wearer's uh, face and head to the back of the helmet uh, to brace uh, for the impact and prevent as much whiplash as possible. Um, you know, and it's it's all very stiffening. And when you're wearing a helmet like this, you can't even see your hands uh, in the reins of the horse. So again, never to be used in battle. Um, it's, it makes you much less mobile, but you know, there is a fallacy that was attached to this type of helmet, this called in German a Schutzkette helm, uh, which is that at the moment, just before possible impact, you would straighten up your body and avert your eyes. But we know from period uh, tracks that that's the opposite of what you want to do. You needed to keep your eyes on the lance so that you could hit your opponent. And that the design feature here of this helmet, it, this angle is actually to divert the lance head away from your, your face and from your eyes, almost like a plowshare, you know, as a, like a ship prow. Um, and I do uh, absolutely see ridges uh, in the designs of helmets that uh, you've shared with me, uh, Kevin, like this um, lacrosse helmet, right? Um, right? You know, another aspect is the after impact of hitting the ground. Yeah. And you can see with this great helm, there are ridges on the back of the head. And I'm seeing that in your design here too, right? Right, so as you wear, you know, the shoulder pads and the chest protectors and things like that, if you were to fall backwards, your body's off the ground a little further, which would cause uh, some more whiplash when your head goes back. So uh, we made efforts uh, similar to some of the armor to sculpt uh, the geometry so that your head would hit, the, the helmet would hit the ground and not cause the whiplash. Uh, an interesting uh, thing I also see on the slide back, um, I wonder if they have put uh, um, thought into tying down the head on the inside so that when you do take an impact or a secondary impact on the ground, if it helps hold your head from sloshing back and forth and hitting the inside of the armor. Just a- just Yeah, it was the, um, the side to side fit of these, as I understand it, would have been extremely tight. Um, and these little points, uh, these little uh, looking like agalettes or, or these little um, laces, uh, not only kept the lining in place, but also you know fixed it in that way. 
Yeah. Um, and uh, and you're seeing that there is a double strap system here actually in play that it, you're strapped in the back as well as the front. Um, but uh, it's 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 complex and it took a lot of uh, a few centuries to develop to that stage uh, from what was the great helm in the, in the 12th century. Uh, but you know, looking at the padding uh, that you have designed, your your company has designed for these lacrosse helmets. You know, what I find interesting too is you have, what is it at the back of the neck? It's, it's also another way, uh, like these straps yeah. uh, of, of tightening. Um, so the, yeah, these images are, are uh, concept images of different kinds of padding that could go in the helmet. Um, you'll also notice that they are cut out into different zones. So we, we, uh, we try to put different density of pads in different areas where different impacts are going to happen. Uh, the area that you're talking back in the back there where it's kind of red in the back there is a dial system. Uh, so not unlike the leather straps where you're pulling them to tighten the head into a position, um, this concept uses the dial, which pulls on some wires that are hooked into the foam mm -hmm. and, and tightens around the head inside the helmet. Oh, wow. Very analogous. Or a way to do it with new technology. You know, and obviously using different foams and in, in then then the smelly wool, but <laughs> perhaps. Right. But uh, well, they, the, the foams can be stinky too. <laughs> oh, that's true. I guess that is true. So this is one of my favorite helms that I couldn't resist putting in here. This is for a different uh, sport altogether. The tourney, which is a later version of the melee, which is a mock a battle. Uh, so it's much more akin to what you would wear in warfare. Um, with uh, which is much closer fitting to the head, more mobility, although it's a little heavier than the helmet you would wear in warfare, maybe about three or four pounds heavier. So in, in essence, this, this helmet is, is probably close to eight pounds, uh, seven or eight pounds or so. Uh, it's from about 1580. But here we're seeing also an asymmetry of the designs that were used here. So, you know, you receive blows on the left, uh, but so they've strengthened the left side of the helmet and you have these breathing holes, ventilation on the right side. Another feature is fun here is that I call it a helmet kickstand. It's a little device that's meant to, to hold up the visor so you could take in ear air uh, when, when you could, when you weren't in the thick of uh, the tournament. But also you're seeing at the back of the neck, these laces that again, um, a tie. Uh, here actually there's sword cuts uh, on the left side. So we know this was used as blunted swords in the tourney. And then here is the inside. It, this is unusual that it survives with these cross straps, these suspension straps. Uh, it would have had a padded lining as you see in the diagram on the left uh, to which was stitched to these leathers, these internal leather bands in there. Uh, but uh, you know, we were talking, you, you've seen suspension straps like this before. Um, oh, well, well, suspension straps like this don't, I mean, we've used these up, up to probably, uh, I don't know, 1980s in the military, military helmets had leather suspension straps and fabric suspension straps. And uh, yeah. back in the 40s, football helmets uh, mm -hmm. had straps like this. So it doesn't, doesn't go back too far where you mm -hmm. have some kind of suspension system, you have a shell and you have an air layer mm -hmm. in it that essentially is your padding. And, and absorb the shock. Um, mm -hmm. and, well, it gives you time, sense. impact, and time to impact, yes. And of course, this is uh, one of your uh, designs for the so this, football helmets. This, this is a, another concept that shows the interior padding and the different zones uh, mm -hmm. that we would design for. So up the middle of the crown, you can see some of that yellow. Um, mm -hmm. Not only the graphic application, but it would be a different kind of pad that would be in there. Mm -hmm. And the different forehead pad you can see there on the left with the black, um, and then you know, different foam little pods placed uh, appropriately for different impacts. Yeah, it strikes me how similar it is to the few linings that do survive in the period, the way they, they unfold and obviously have to deal with the same space, the human right. head. Right. Um, and so now I want to turn to actually the body. Uh, so here is our jousting armor uh, from 1560 that's on display in the center of our galleries. Um, you know, armors like this were exactly what were worn in occasions like this, this, this ill-fated situation that happened in 1559 when the King Henry II of France participated in a joust uh, celebrating peace treaties uh, 
with the Habsburgs, uh, but also the wedding of his daughter. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, he took a lance splinter to the eye uh, through his oculus, through the, the vision slit of his helmet. Um, and he died uh, roughly, I believe, about 10 days later. Um, and the surgeons or, or the, the, uh, the doctors who looked at him, uh, the famous Ambrose Paré uh, and um, uh, Vesalius, who was a, all about anatomy, uh, looked at his postmortem body uh, and they determined that, you know, he actually died from his brain, his concu the concussion to his brain. His brain basically putrefied over several days. Uh, he had internal bleeding. It wasn't just the injury to his eye. Uh, in fact. So even with this highly developed equipment, uh, like this armor we're seeing here, accidents most certainly still happened. Um, uh, but, you know, there was a, you know, this did get refined further and further and further to prevent uh, this kind of injury. So it was, it was a give and a take. Um, you know, what do we see in some of the features of this armor? One important feature is the lance rest. Uh, which is this hook uh, bolted uh, to the right side of the breastplate, uh, which allowed for the lance uh, to be held. Uh, this is a diagram of a lance uh, being held uh, against this hook. And that's what it is. It's meant to grapple and take the force of the lance. Uh, there's a part called a grapper. It's a roll of leather or a steel ring or collar behind the handle. And that hits against this serrated uh, hook, the lance rest. And so it allows all the force of the horse and rider into the point of the lance. And um, you were sharing with me, Kevin, uh, some of your own designs. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I would say is that armor for the tournament was probably testing grounds for armor for war and right. lance rests were also used for war. And it, it seems like your company is uniquely doing both as well. So we, we've, do, we've done a lot of concepts uh, to help uh, not only sport, but our, our police and things like that, but it's all protective gear. And uh, this concept here on the left shows some thigh protection um, where we built in a ridge. You can see that protuberance there. Um, and that does two things. That not only strengthens that panel, um, but it also gives a place for the shield to rest. So when you're standing there uh, at attention, uh, you might just be uh, waiting for something to happen. You don't mm -hmm. have to lay it down and not be prepared. You can always be in a prepared situation and you won't have to hold it up in front of you for hours at a time. You have a place to put it. So that when I saw your image, uh, it reminded me of you know, the current designs and how we can adapt the gear for, for current uses like that. And, and this is, a, I believe, another prototype for, for Riot Gear that you've been uh, designing or looking at. And this one struck me most of all of the similarity, the asymmetry yeah. to armor. So this, this was a concept that was done um, and you could, you could almost tell that if somebody was holding a shield and had, had this flare over their shoulder that they could tuck their chin in uh, and avoid impacts with uh, projectiles or, or whatever it might be coming their way. Um, it was just a concept, uh, unlike uh, some of the armor that's built uh, specifically maybe for one person or a couple people uh, and is asymmetrical for the sport, uh, many of the things we do have to be a little more universal. Um, mm -hmm. We design for the masses and for cost and for manufacturing and things like that. So uh, it's a little different yeah. respect. Yeah, that's a good point. So armor was so often... Uh, meant to fit uh, an individual, uh, you know, it was tailor made, not to say that there wasn't armor for uh, the more common soldier or masses uh, that was small, medium and large that of course did exist, but this kind of sports equipment was specially made. Our armor, this Italian armor 1560, this we know was retrofitted to multiple people. So here the reinforce over the left side has been removed and we can see the bolts that bolt it down have been moved three times to fit three different sized people uh, so that the eye and vision slit and all that coordinate into a different place. Uh, you were just saying that's not the case for you as a manufacturer, a modern manufacturer, that the bespoke riot gear is, doesn't exist as much, right? <laughs> Well, yeah, one of the goals for this project, uh, as you could imagine, if you were a community that needed uh, this protective gear, you don't want to buy five different sizes and fit every officer. Like that. So we try to design so it fit, we call it fitting most. 
Uh, yes. You have your outliers, but uh, yeah, it needs to fit a lot of different size people. And, uh, you know, another topic here, of course, is the undergarments. Uh, this is probably one of the only or the only surviving uh, arming doublet from the 16th century. It's in the National Museum of Scotland. Mm -hmm. Its outer layer is silk. Its inner layer is um, linen uh, and it's quilted and it's, it's form fitted. And, uh, you know, that was also a fashion. You know, the, there is an idea that doublets, the, out, the wear of court, attire in this period was based on what you wore under armor as well. And it seems to me actually we're in a period of that as well. And uh, this is another concept that you showed me. Yeah, this was a concept of, of gear that obviously could be worn underneath protective gear, but uh, in today's apparel, um, most people wear compression wear as, as fashion as well. So um, this was designed to, to manage heat, to manage uh, mm -hmm. Sweat, uh, sweat wicking materials. There's mm -hmm. compression built into it, um, um, but it also is just a fashion statement as well. Yeah, I um, I think we can see here. Fashion was very much part of the tournament scene. Uh, in this case, with the foot combat at the barriers, uh, you know, they wore their armor for the event on, from the waist up and from the waist down. It was their courtly attire. Uh, you know, these. Uh, you know, sweat was certainly a problem here to in ventilation, uh, so, but it, clearly these it, these uh, doublets that they wore, you know, they as the surviving one shows, uh, there was a sweat component um, for sure. Uh, this event, you know, the main scoring was to hit each other in the head, and our helmet actually shows a lot of uh, dents uh, from uh, that occurrence. Uh, and you know, here is image uh, of the contestants. Uh, some were against uh, blunted swords and some were against these blunted spears. And again, no hits below uh, the waist. So they have this bar to prevent that. Uh, this armor is configured here for the sword. So it has symmetrical shoulder defenses. Uh, but then there was the asymmetry of the shoulder defenses. So you could have lateral movement hitting each other uh, with the spear. And so uh, this is all about articulation. And you know, in the armor, they use systems of rivets uh, and what we call turners, which you're seeing in this diagram. And so I have a, a brief three minute um, uh, video here uh, in cue the video to, so you can see some of this articulation and you can get an idea of how this material moved. So here I have some examples of plate armor uh, from the 16th uh, in early 17th century um, that cover uh, parts of the body that move the most, the legs, the thighs, and the arms. Uh, so here first I have what is called a greave, which is armor for the shin, and a sabaton, uh, armor for the foot, um, which was probably made in southern Germany uh, around uh, 1550, 1560. And let me just show you first how one can walk in this. You can see the foot actually comes in and out very simply. And more importantly, the artistry that's involved here is the compound curves of these overlapping plates. These are called lanes, so that a sword or a point of any kind of weapon can just glance off. On the inside, you have uh, a series of rivets connecting each of the overlapping plates. And you can see they all move in and out. In some degree, it's more flexible than actually the human foot. Over here, I have what's called a long tacit, or a part of the armor that covers the thigh. Uh, and you can imagine uh, you need a lot of flexibility there. Well, this is possible with a series of leathers, internal leathers connected by rivets to the individual plates, which are also called lames. And you can see it's entirely open on one side. Um, they're just connected by leather. But on the other side, it's connected by rivets that move up and down in slots. These are called sliding rivets. And lastly, I have here uh, two examples of what are called them braces, armor for the arms. Um, here is a left vem brace. And very typically, uh, these are joined with what is called a cowder in the center, which protects the elbow, and lames on either side, and then the upper and then the lower vem brace. You see they move up and down just like so. Um, on pivoting simply on rivets. You can see the internal workings of that. 
more complex examples of embraces, like this example uh, from about the 1520s, German, uh, you see the entire inner arm is enclosed, unlike this example. Um, and this would have been more expensive armor, certainly. And in fact, it's more likely that this was an armor uh, possibly for tournament use, uh, particularly foot combat tournaments, where you might want uh, extra protection inside your arm uh, from sword points. And on the top of the arm, to get those lateral movements, you have what is called a turner. That's essentially an embossed piece of steel where the lower part of the vembrace fits into the upper part and it keys in like this, and it allows it to rotate in and out, giving full movement. Now one last part of this armor, we have this wing here um, on the counter. This in fact is removable by taking the pin, moving it to the side, and putting it off. Well, Kevin, what did you think of that articulation uh, in terms of what do you what we have going on these days? <laughs> it, well, it's it's fascinating because I, I don't know that we've made uh, huge leaps and jumps from what they've done back. That's then. interesting. We use rivets now. We use uh, internal strapping to help articulation. Um, you know, we might have new technology like Velcro or something like that. Yes. Um, we often use nylon straps. Uh, to hook things together so that a panel overlaps, like you can see the drawing on the left, that upper arm pad has some overlap, but you know it's got to move. So we do put straps in between them. Um, and we do, and the fact that that one comes off is really interesting. I'm, I'm wondering if the need was to customize it for a certain use at one time or another, or uh, do they put a bigger pad on or a smaller pad? Because many times we also design uh, where a different user might want a different pad in a situation so it's customizable. That wow, way. yes, there's, there's, especially in the 16th century, there's a lot of armor uh, called garnitures that allow for that adaptability right. um, in, in customization. Um, some of these, we talked about tournaments for war, uh, or tournaments uh, that are meant to be like war or the bat, you know, um, you, you would use your battle gear, but you could customize and add an extra uh, layer here or there, an extra plate, particularly in the 15th and more especially in the 16th century. Um, and that was a type of tournament that you might uh, go into. Um, but so this is, yep, go ahead, sorry. No, sorry, Jonathan. Uh, one, one of the things that, that I notice with a lot of the armor is the midsection being mm -hmm. uh, very rigid. Um, yes. And that, you know, it's a, it's a use scenario uh, design uh, where our designs nowadays in the sports we play you need a lot of mobility in the abdomen area. And although we have coverage that comes down over the abdomen and over the kidneys and things like that, it's still very flexible so that you are able to move around and twist and things like that. And uh, so what are we looking at with these concepts? Are, what are they for? This is for ice hockey, uh, men's ice hockey. And uh, it is a concept you can see uh, the different colors and the different, uh, you, you can call it quilting almost. There's different molded pieces that offer different levels of protection, uh, different breathability, different heat management. Um, we pay particular attention to high impact zones uh, like the chest or the sternum area. We usually have added extra protection and hard shells over those areas. Maybe your spine, uh, more protection over your shoulders because you're taking a lot of impact in the shoulder. Um, but you'll see how the, the pads come down to the kidney area and wrap around and then you have fastening system down near the kidney areas. And it, it's, uh, it's probably a much more uh, quick use uh, fastening system than with the arm oh. with the buckles. And, right. uh, well, you, you, I mean, we're you, definitely looking at modern materials that don't rust uh, and don't have to be polished constantly. Um, mm -hmm. So that's definitely uh, a help. And I should say too, uh, there is some reference that the inside of some armors, particularly tournament armors were varnished uh, possibly to help against the rust that could happen from the internal padding uh, or the sweat from the wearer. Um, but, uh, you know, whereas you, you want it to be washable, right? <laughs> yeah, we definitely want to be able to throw this in the, in the, uh, the wash. They have industrial washers for the gear. Um, it can get pretty nasty, as you can imagine. <laughs> One of the things that I wanted to point out, Jonathan, that, I, that I've noticed with the armor, um, a lot of the necks are protected. You have either off of the headgear it comes down or some other protection for the neck. Um, and in today's 
gear and sports, that's one area that is probably the least protected uh, because oh, interesting. And to keep your eyesight and being able to see left to right and things like that. I guess it's it, on the sport, but uh -huh. it's just something. And you think that's because the helmet sort of takes up for that to some degree. Um, sometimes, but um, sometimes like that lacrosse helmet you, you had up or, you know, the jaw comes down where it can protect mm -hmm. the front of your neck. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, one thing that strikes me about this too is fashion and image. Uh, you and I have talked about sort of how it needs to look cool too, right? Yeah, right. Uh, and these designs, they do that for me, I think. And what strikes me immediately is it reminds me of 16th century armor where you have this V-shaped torso. It's very slimming, but this broad uh, shoulder, um, basically this male athlete image maybe hasn't changed so much in 500 years entirely. Um, and, uh, you know, we see that here with the, the foot combat armors, again, broad shoulders, tight nipped in waist, um, and, uh, you know, these lines, uh, you know, image is important, uh, in the tournament. These designs also went for the panache, which is literally the feathers that you would wear in these foot uh, tournaments and designers were used specifically for, for the feathers. So self image, uh, a very different image, I think, with this <laughs> than what we have in our modern sports, but was hugely important. And so I, I wanted to finish uh, with this rather strange uh, juxtaposition, um, you know, really about portraiture, about showing yourself. Uh, this a portrait of uh, Lucio uh, Foppa, he's being shown in foot combat armor for the, the tournament. And it's specifically tournament armor, like the one I just showed you. And, and he wants to be seen as this participant in this courtly uh, event. Uh, it's a, a lot different, like elegant in, you know, pardon his last name, but also foppish. Um, uh, but it, it's supposed to communicate his participation in this, this athletic event, this, this sport. Uh, and in this, this sort of macho use of armor for self-image. And I think the riot gear sort of hero shot that uh, you, you've you shown to me, uh, it communicates something similar. Uh, it, think, it has to look cool, right? Uh, absolutely. I think not even just this, when we do helmets for mm -hmm. baseball or lacrosse, um, you know, when you get a professional baseball player and you put a new helmet on him, he puts it on, he goes over to the mirror and looks at it. And, mm -hmm. and he has, you know, he's looking for the cool factor. He's not going to wear something out to the mound that makes him look, foolish, you know, um, so it definitely needs to look uh, cool um, and it needs to perform. And for something like uh, what's showing on the screen here, um, you know, I think I think they need to to look uh, like like they're a badass. Right. So, you, yeah, you definitely uh, yeah, excuse yeah. my English, but yeah. Uh, you know, you have an attitude that you're trying to portray and control a situation, and um, you're probably not wearing feathers on your hat in this case. So, you know, you look and you design the gear to look like this. Yeah, it's for better or for worse, it, it does project an image. Um, yes. And I think uh, culturally speaking, we have uh, different associations with both these images for sure, but it is uh, presenting the male physique in a certain way. Um, and using hard, this hard shell to communicate that. Um, and, you know, self-image uh, is so ingrained in our psyche. And it's interesting uh, to compare how design is, again, not just to protect the body, but to exude, to put forward uh, these images. Uh, but, uh, and I, I am curious, it, it, it fascinates me too how uh, you, Kevin, um, in priority designs, you're you are designing for both these. You're you're designing for the sports as well as uh, for personal protection uh, in in armed forces and what have you. So, it's all solutions to the body, uh, to the problems that the body can face. And we we ha we we kind of use the category of protective gear mm -hmm. uh, on any part of the body, including the teeth, uh, all the way down to the feet and the head and. Uh, and, and what the future might bring with protecting the body from the inside out and uh, things like that. So yes, we, we're, we're in all different categories. 
<laughs> well, thank you. Well, Courtney, I wanted to bring you back and ask uh, if there are some questions we could field. I know we probably went over, but um, yes. Yes, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin and, and Jonathan, for that great conversation. We do have some audience questions. We'd love to dive into a couple of those. Um, our first question, um, there, were, there are certainly regulations in place for many modern pieces of sports equipment. Um, in tournament era, were there similar regulations for, um, for equipment that we know of? That is absolutely a great question. Absolutely. Uh, in fact, the cartel or sometimes these uh, call to arms for a tournament that was sent out these invitations, they dictated exactly um, what it was um, uh, that you could use and could not use as your equipment. Uh, for instance, uh, there's a very famous example of Henry VIII and the King of France, Francis I, uh, try, going back and forth as to what equipment was going to be allowed or not. Uh, one of those pieces was supposed to be um, uh, to use these uh, locking gauntlets, these gauntlets that have uh, spring-loaded catches that would allow you to hold and grip your object and not lose your grip. Uh, technological advance at that time. And there was a question back and forth whether those would be allowed or not. Um, and, and pieces like that, that, that was key and important uh, to set the rules before uh, all these tournaments. So absolutely in a very similar way. It's very probably, good probably to prevent them from gaining an advantage, right? To keep exactly. It. And they called these pieces, pieces of advantage uh, yeah. in the period. That is what they called it exactly in English. And that's what's even in that document. Interesting. Uh, pieces yeah. of advantage. Interesting, thank you. Um, this question asks, um, are there examples of armor produced today specifically for pageantry? Maybe the, the Swiss Guard? Um, is there armor like that still being produced? Uh, I do understand that the Swiss Guards uh, got a, a, um, uh, a revamp, uh, I think about three or four years ago. I might be off, it might have been longer than that. Uh, they decided, I think, to stop using the corselets, the, the breast and back plate and shoulder defenses, which I believe might have been uh, somewhat period uh, for some of them the, from the 16th or 17th century. And they had them uh, made by a, it might have been a German armor uh, to copy those designs in for the next generation to use. Uh, new armor. Uh, the helmets that they wear are designed after 16th century Morians, but believe it or not, they're made out of aluminum, so that they're lightweight and they're vented. There's little perforations in what's called the comb so that they vent a little bit more because uh, they're not being used to protect their actual heads. They're more of the image of the past of bodyguards uh, for the Pope from the 16th century. Uh, and so that happened in the early 20th century that they designed those helmets most especially. Uh, this Colonel of the Swiss Guards, Colonel Rapun, uh, helped design that helmet um, and again, using lightweight materials like aluminum uh, for that purpose. So that is an example of, of pageantry still using fanfare, that image. Um, there's probably many others, uh, of course, the classic yeoman guards uh, for Queen Elizabeth uh, II, you know, they're still going around in semi sort of uh, uh, costume that relates to, to Henry VIII, but you know, they're not actually uh, using armor, they are using arms. But uh, I don't know, Kevin, do you know of examples where it's not actually meant to function uh, for sports, uh, rather? I don't know. That's a good question. Um, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I don't know of any. Certainly, there are parades and, and things that people put on what semblance looks like uh, armor. But we'd be interested if people also make faux sports equipment uh, <laughs> in a similar way. But I don't know. I, um, I think the sports gear is just common enough that you don't need to really make the fake stuff you can you can just yeah that's true it's not quite as expensive grab the real stuff yeah, yeah. Uh, i guess the equivalent question. would be like sports jerseys that are sold to non yes oh, sure yeah yeah, yeah. A lot of, um, of course uh, and we do have another another question um it was joining any of the tournaments mandatory and and were there well-known figures at the time such as today's you know elite sport celebrities uh, joining tournaments mandatory. I, I don't, not so sure about being mandatory, but certainly there was uh, peer pressure. Literally, peer as in lords and you know ladies pressuring you uh, 
that you should be at rank involved in this. I, one classic example I can talk about is uh, off the top of my head, uh, the prince uh, and later, of course, King of Spain, Philip II. Um, he was pressured by his father, Charles V, uh, Holy Roman Emperor and uh, also King of Spain uh, to participate in jousts when he was younger and to display him as the heir apparent to show his uh, macho machismo at court, uh, particularly when he was parading him around uh, the Netherlands, uh, which, as I said, was sort of an origin point, uh, Southern Netherlands for tournaments. So that was part of their culture. And if he was going to be their ruler, he needed to show that he was ingrained in that culture. He hated jousting. We know that. Uh, we know that he had accidents and he, there's even a treatise on jousting from that period that says, you know, uh, my grace, uh, the king was, is, is, is no, something to the fact that he's like no great jouster, but he's very skilled with the horse. Um, so, <laughs> you know, there, there are examples where uh, there, I like to say it's not so different than like um, golf in, uh, in modern um, executive culture or other sports like that. Uh, you want to take training, you want to take exercise with it so that when it comes time with your peers uh, and you have to pl play golf and expect to perhaps play golf, you, you show yourself to, to be somewhat fluent and able. Uh, you don't make a fool of yourself. And that was certainly true of the period too. That was part of their networking system. Uh, in these courts. And so I'm sure there were plenty of people that did not want to take the risk, but maybe felt pressured to. And as I said, fatalities did happen. Thank you, Jonathan. Kevin, anything to add? I think we're we're coming up on, on our time here. Is there anything no. you did, felt like you, we didn't get to cover? No, I, you know, the only word that there's a little buzzword that uh, is so relevant to some of the articulation that was shown in that video um, that we use today is biomimicry and mm -hmm. often look to nature um, and different animals. And you think of an armadillo or something like that, mm -hmm. and it relates to how that protective gear works. And that, that gear, I almost want an example of that gear here. It moves and articulates so well. Um, that's, that's really fascinating stuff, but. And Kevin, I, I know you were mentioning to me that you're considering articulation in future products. Is that, I know you can't probably say very much about that, but. Yeah, a, a lot of times, uh, I mean, there are many products right now that we have that are going into production and we can't talk about them, unfortunately. Um, that's the reality. Um, <laughs> Big there, secrets like then too. <laughs> there, there is a, um, I, I'll, I'll hit it quickly here, but the, there is a piece of protective gear you talked about, whiplash and things like that. And we, the, the, the common term now with concussions and brain slosh um, working on, and it's, it's just gone through the FDA and things like that. It's a collar you wear, and it actually controls blood flow from the inside and the blood flow in your brain and helps control the brain slosh and control the concussions. Wow. So it, you, know, you go way back to a piece of armor on your head that weighs 50 pounds to something that's in the future that you might just wear on your neck and the helmet's not as important to control uh, what happens to your brain, it certainly will help an impact or a secondary impact when your head hits the ground, but um, we're working on a lot of cool stuff. That's that's the future. And if only Henry II in uh, 1559 had that collar, maybe yeah. he would have lived in uh, history would have been very different for that poor country. Uh, yeah. But uh, that that is absolutely fascinating. Um, and, you know, I, I'm struck at by how well armors did do with their empiricism. Uh, but now today you, we have med medicine um, in studies, as you're saying, uh, and real, uh, are they called bioengineers? I mean, I'm not sure. How do you, how do you express that? We have, we have lots of different kinds of engineers here from mechanical, uh, biomedical to, uh, I mean, biomedical to uh, electrical. Um, and we all work together with our ID department and research and, um, you know, to come up with the next best uh performance right we're always looking at the performance and how to make better, it better just like they did back then mm -hmm. you know, they made improvements uh they failed they made improvements um and and that's part of the development process uh, and that's what's so fascinating when you came to me is there's so many similarities to how they probably went through iterative process to get uh, to where they are and it's not different than what we do today yeah absolutely well, thank you again so much, Kevin and Jonathan, um, for, for being here with us this evening. And thank you Thanks all for, for, for 
Thank you all for joining us um, for, for the program. We hope that you all will get a chance to visit the Deering Family Galleries of Medieval and Renaissance Art, Arms and Armor again soon. And for more information on upcoming virtual events, please visit us online at artic.edu and look for our monthly e-news in your inboxes. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. See you.